On the 27th of April 2020, I posted a video on the mysteries surrounding the area known as the Alaska Triangle. And in that video, I spoke about a place called Port Chatham, a ghost town where a lot of strange things were said to have happened prior to people leaving the town, seemingly overnight. While I was making the Alaska Triangle video, I felt like the story surrounding Port Chatham and Portlock, as it's actually called, was an interesting one, so I decided to bookmark it and revisit it at some later time. And at the time, early 2020, there were very few people who covered this topic, at least on YouTube. A year later, I then posted the Portlock video, which was on February 27th, 2021. But over time, I've really grown to hate that original Portlock video, and I've been thinking about remaking it for some time now. It's a gamble since it is the biggest video on my channel, but I'd rather have a video that gets no views than a video that I don't like that gets nearly a million views. If you've listened to this ramble, I thank you. But let's not delay any longer. Let's get into what this video is actually about. The story about what might have happened in the town of Portlock, whether you believe it or not, is an interesting story. So, for the third time on this channel, let's go back to Portlock, Alaska. Portlock is a town that is located on the southern tip of the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska, United States. The official name for the area is Portlock, but to many, like the people who were raised in the town, the town is known as Port Chatham. While the southern tip of the Kenai Peninsula had been home to Native Americans for thousands of years, it would not become a settlement until the 1780s. In 1786, Captain Nathaniel Portlock of the Royal British Navy arrived in the area during an Alaska expedition. The area would then be known as Portlock. It wouldn't take long before that small bay that was way out on the tip of the Kenai Peninsula in southern Alaska was called home by many people. Around the year 1900, an American firm had built a cannery and brought in a fleet of fishing boats to take advantage of the healthy run of salmon that was in those calm waters. By the early 20th century, Portlock was an active community that was thriving on salmon canneries. The residents of the town were mostly fishermen, lumbermen, and miners, and nearly all of them were of Russian and Alaska native descent. At one point, the town had a chromite mine and a boarding school for the children of the Kenai Peninsula. By 1921, Portlock was doing so well that the US government decided to set up a post office in the town, which opened that same year. At this point, Portlock was, by all accounts, a lovely place to live. But over time, that opinion changed. And by the 1950s, Portlock was a ghost town. Communities dying out slowly over time is nothing new and it happens all over the world. But according to the stories, Portlock was different. Allegedly, the residents all packed up and left in 1949 and moved up the coast to another community called Port Graham. The only person who remained in the town after that was the postmaster, who had to remain behind until the post office had closed completely, which happened in 1950. One comment that often popped up in my original Portlock video was about what the postmaster might have seen during that final year in the town. Even if you remove the supernatural elements to this story, his account would still be an interesting one. After all, he was all alone in a ghost town for a year. I went looking, but I wasn't able to find anything about the postmaster. All the articles and posts about the town that I could find simply said that he was there for a year before he left in 1950 when the post office was closed. He's not even named in most of the write-ups about Portlock that I could find.
Despite seemingly being a nice place to live, Portlock had its share of problems. In 1905, records made by a Portlock cannery management showed that all of the native workers had evacuated the area. When asked why, they stated that there was something in the forest that made them feel unsafe. The workers did eventually return a year later, but the reports that something weird was going on kept coming. And in the beginning years of World War II, rumors began spreading that something was very wrong in the town of Portlock. The source for the tales of what happened in Portlock is a 2009 article in the Homer Tribune. The author of the article, Naomi Kura, appears to have relied on two main sources. The first one is an article in the Anchorage Daily News that is called Portlock, Home of a Sasquatch by Robert J. Dolezal that was published on April 15, 1973. The article can be found in the Anchorage Daily News archive, but I'm gonna be honest, I really did not feel like giving out my credit card information for one article for a YouTube video. I'll still link the archive below if any of you do want to check it out. The other source that was used in the 2009 article is a Nanwalek elder named Melania Helen Kell, who grew up in Portlock and was residing in Port Graham when Kura came to speak with her. I even found a video from 2014 where Kell speaks about Bigfoot, or the creature known as the Nantinak. <laughs> She said it started out from a park lock. People came on the skin boat. Kel was born in Port Chatham in 1934 and was still a baby when her family had abruptly moved away from the town. And according to Kel, it wasn't a single event that had scared her family enough to flee the town. Instead, her family had simply had enough of being terrorized by a Nantinak. And her family soon felt that the best option for them was to start anew somewhere else. It's not unthinkable that this was true for the other residents of Portlock as well. The disappearances, the deaths, and whatever was terrorizing the residents simply took its toll on people and they decided to leave, if only for their own peace of mind. So what was terrorizing the people? Well, a lot of rumors had been spreading. For instance, it was said that people who headed into the mountains would either disappear or turn up dead. There is one story about a gold miner that was from Port Graham that went off to work one day and was never seen again. Another example is when a group of cannery workers went up into the hills to hunt doll sheep and bear, but that was never seen again. At least not until one of them had washed down the stream. The body was horribly mutilated and dismembered. These wounds did not seem to be typical of a bear attack. This particular story comes from the 1973 issue of the Anchorage Daily News. A retired school teacher who had been teaching in Port Chatham during World War II is the one who told the writer of the cannery workers. This is also where the stories of bodies being found mutilated also seem to have originated, as the article supposedly mentions that rumors started to spread about bodies that were mutilated being swept down the mountain by rain and ending up in the lagoon. Another story about the strange events in Portlock involves a group of hunters tracking a moose. When tracking this moose, they found that something was already tracking the moose. Something that left big, man-like footprints that were over 18 inches in length. Following these two sets of tracks, the hunters soon came across a flattened spot in the brush. There were signs of a short struggle where the grass had been matted down and, according to some sources, there was also blood. But there were no signs of the moose or even the other creature that had attacked it. The only tracks that left the area was that of the unknown creature and those tracks was heading up into the foggy mountains. 
which led the hunters to conclude that this big-footed animal must have simply killed the moose and then took the moose with it when it left. They decided not to follow the tracks anymore and they instead went back to the town. In the 2009 interview, Kel also speaks of her godfather, a man by the name of Andrew Kamlock. In 1931, he was found dead in the woods from a blow to the head. A piece of log-moving equipment was found nearby, and this was assumed to have been the murder weapon. But everyone thought that was very strange, because that log-moving equipment should have been too heavy for someone to lift and wield as a weapon. The article also speaks briefly to another Port Graham elder, Simeon Kwasnikov, who also makes reference to the Nantinok. According to Kwasnikov, the gold miner that I mentioned earlier had a little place where he would dig for gold. One day he went up to his area where he would dig for gold and never came back. No one found any trace of him and soon the creature known as the Nantinok would be blamed for his disappearance. Another strange account comes from a sawmill worker named Tom Larson. His job was to cut wood for the old fish traps and one day he reportedly spotted a huge hairy man that was destroying the fish wheels along the beach. He immediately ran back to get his rifle and when he returned to the beach, the creature was just standing there, staring at him. He found himself in a bit of a standoff with the creature. For a short time, they just stood there staring at each other. But eventually the creature had had enough and turned and left. Larson would never be able to explain why he didn't shoot. There's also a post from an online forum that I wanted to highlight. A man posted on this particular forum and he wanted to remain anonymous and was using the name Ed, which is what I will be referring to him as. And the story is about when he worked as a paramedic in Anchorage in 1990. During that time, he was called out on an alarm of a man that was having a heart attack in the state jail in Eagle River. The man was in his 70s and he was also native Alaskan from Port Graham. After getting the man stabilized, Ed and his colleague began transporting him to the native hospital in Anchorage. While heading to the hospital, Ed and this man started talking, specifically about hunting. At some point, Ed would mention a time he had been to Dogfish Bay. This made the elderly man sit up suddenly and grab the front of Ed's shirt. The elderly man would then lock eyes with Ed and say clearly, Did it bother you? Ed was stunned for a moment, but he would reply, Yes. The elderly man then asked, Did you see it? Ed would reply, No. Did you see it? The elderly man then said, No, but my brother seen it. It chased him. Ed then goes on to recount the story of what happened when he had been to Dogfish Bay. According to Ed, this was in August 1973. He was there bow hunting for goats and black bears with two others, when a sudden storm suddenly swept into the area and they were forced to seek shelter in Dogfish Bay. So they set up camp, cooked something to eat and then retreated back into their tent. Then, around 2 a.m., one of Ed's companions woke him up after he had allegedly heard what sounded like footsteps outside the tent. These steps did not sound like a bear. It sounded so like something heavy that was walking on two feet. This was enough to terrify them, leaving them really scared about the coming night. And sure enough, during that second night, they once again heard footsteps outside of the tent. This time though, they crept out of the tent and turned their flashlight on. But they saw nothing. No signs of whatever it was that was creeping around outside their tent. No tracks. Nothing. Because of the weather, the men were forced to stay in the area for three nights. Those three nights were spent being terrified of whatever this thing outside their tent was. But on the third night, they agreed that if they heard anything, they would run out of the tent with their weapons and shoot. But during that third night, all was quiet. Then on the fourth day, there was a break in the weather, so they decided to make a run for it. 
I should point out though that this story by Ed is sometimes also told as an example of an encounter with some other known cryptid from North America, not necessarily Bigfoot. It is mentioned in the 2009 article, so I felt like I should mention it. The stories did not stop simply because Portlock was abandoned. Alaska is home to numerous sightings of the big hairy creature known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. There have been many reports of people encountering strange creatures out in the Alaskan wilderness, with some claiming to have been chased by this creature, while others simply say that they saw something strange in the wilderness. Many of the indigenous cultures across the North American continent have tales of mysterious hair-covered creatures that live in the forests. These legends are said to have existed long before any contemporary reports of the creature that we call Bigfoot. Though these legends may differ in the details from region to region. One example of a very old depiction of a hairy man comes from petroglyphs that was created by a tribe of Yokuts at a site called Painted Rock. These glyphs are estimated to be somewhere between 500 to 1000 years old. And in the 16th century, Spanish explorers and Mexican settlers in California would tell stories about beings that they would call the Dark Watchers large creatures that stalked their camps at night, very much like the post that Ed wrote about his own experience. But the creature would not be called Bigfoot until 1958. That year, a man named Jerry Crew, who worked as a logging company bulldozer operated in Humboldt County, California, discovered a set of large human-like footprints that appeared to be 16 inches in length in the mud of the Six Rivers National Forest. He told his co-workers of this discovery and many of them claimed that they had seen similar tracks on previous job sites. Because the tracks was left by something with big feet, Bigfoot became the name that these men would use to describe this creature. Over time, more and more footprints would appear. Eventually, Jerry contacted a reporter named Andrew Gensoli of the Humboldt Times newspaper. Gensoli would come and interview the men and he wrote articles about these mysterious footprints. It's from these articles that the name Bigfoot became introduced to the public. The story would then spread rapidly and the term Bigfoot became the name that referenced these large creatures. Jerry Crew had initially thought that someone was playing a prank on him and his co-workers. And in 2002, this belief was allegedly confirmed by the family of another co-worker of Crew's that was named Ray Wallace, who had since passed away. The family stated that their father had secretly been making these large footprints with carved wooden feet. According to them, this was indeed just a prank. And I should mention this too. The most famous video of an alleged Bigfoot is obviously the Patterson-Gimlin film. Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin were exploring an area called Bluff Creek in Northern California on October 20th, 1967, when they allegedly spotted and recorded the creature. This video has become an iconic piece of Bigfoot lore and has been scrutinized and analyzed many times, with the most common explanation being that the video is nothing but a hoax. Portlock has become known as one of the creepiest places in Alaska. There have been a few expeditions to the area by people who want to see what, if anything, lives in these woods. While the paranormal or supernatural explanation is the more interesting one, maybe there is a logical explanation for why the town was abandoned. One that is similar to the typical stories of why towns and villages are abandoned. Such as depleted natural resources, economic activity shifting elsewhere, human intervention or even disasters. It's possible that the decline of Portlock as a place to live wasn't overnight as is often told, but rather slowly over time. And one reason might be the completion of the Alaska Highway in 1942. 
the completion of the highway would have led to supplies being transported via the highway instead of by ships. And towns like Portlock that were practically inaccessible from the highway would no longer be a viable place to live. Even today, it seems like the only way to get to Portlock, or what remains of Portlock, is by boat. So it's a pretty safe guess that the completion of the highway may have made life more difficult for the residents. Difficult enough that they eventually decided to leave. Not overnight, but gradually over time. So maybe the tales of a Sasquatch-like creature, or even some of the rumors that the area is haunted, are just that. Tales and rumors. I mean, stories of a cryptid being the cause of events happening there is more interesting than stories saying that these events were due to an animal attack, such as a bear. There's also been some speculation that Portlock may have been home to a serial killer, one that was prowling the area and ending the lives of dozens of people, but was never caught. And eventually, people were so terrified of this killer that they decided to flee the town to get away. It's hard to say what the truth may be. But in the end, I don't think it really matters. Whether or not you believe that a Bigfoot-like creature lived in the area, or even that the Alaska Triangle might have something to do with it, Portlock was still a real place. A real place where people were either murdered or disappeared in huge numbers. A real place where people eventually decided to leave. Leaving everything in a town that was once thriving to return to the wilderness. Which alone makes the area where Portlock used to be a very eerie place indeed. Thank you.